Good morning, Cornerstone. It's an undeserved honor to be able to get up here every week and stand before you, open the Word of God to you, have the privilege and the and a shaking to the core of my being to say, thus saith the Lord. And I believe that is what the preacher is to do. And I want to tell you this morning that I love you. I really do love you. It's always true, good to state it today, because you might not like some of the things I say today. Please get your Bibles out. If you do not have a Bible, we want you to get one in your hands. We'll bring it to you. If you don't own a Bible, please take the one that you're given and consider it a gift from God to you. Last Sunday was Life Group Sunday. And so what we did was we spotlighted the ministry of life groups here. We had all the life group leaders up on stage and let them share for a moment about their group and I preached a message on biblical community as a part of that focus to highlight that ministry and so just a statement about that to you. If you were not here, please get online, listen or watch that and if you were here and are not in a life group, I encourage you again to Consider being a part, pray about that, find a life group to go to and visit. What I want to do this morning is I want to preach a complimentary message to that idea of biblical community. It dovetails with that, that actually will help put some flesh on what it means or how we are to live in biblical community. But the primary reason, the primary focus and for the message that I want to preach this morning is related to what I believe is a very needed, relevant word that needs to be shared. It is a relevant word to the cultural reality that we find ourselves in with the, in the world and within America, and within the state of Alaska, and within the city of Anchorage, and right here within this local church. And the state of affairs is this. We are in a grossly fractured culture. The culture is characterized by disunity, not unity. Now, that is not an exclusive statement about the world outside of the church. Often it's a very true statement about the reality within the church. And I don't just mean the church global or the church national. I mean right even within the local body that meet under the same roof. Here's the reality of life. I know that you know this, but I just want to state it. There are always going to be things that we differ over. There are always going to be things that we differ over. It's related to our individuality. You see, each one of us are unique individuals made that way by God. And what each of us has is a very divergent set of life circumstances. And those circumstances have impacted the thought process of our minds and the way that we see the world. And that leads us to decisions that we make and conclusions that we draw and convictions that we live by and what happens is because of that individuality and that divergent reality that we have in walking through life and we are all thinking people that process those things even within a local body like this we can arrive at radically different opinions 
that can threaten the visible unity of the church. Can't threaten the spiritual unity of the church. That's a work that is accomplished by the sovereign God once and for all time, but it can impact the visible unity of the church. Now, there are many topics that I could set before you just to illustrate that reality, the tension, topics that are very divisive in nature. I could just, you could give a list, I could give a list, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly state two. And these two that I'm going to mention, they are going to be topics that are going to need no introduction and no explanation. It's going to be very poignantly, immediately obvious. They are topics of potential division and contention. It's going to stand out in bold relief. In fact, when I say them, some of you are going to get uncomfortable. Here they are. Vaccine or no vaccine, masks or no masks. Point made. You're all tracking. I'm absolutely sure you're all tracking with me. What I want to do is I want to look into the Word of God. I want to look at a letter that Paul wrote, a portion of a letter that Paul wrote to a church, a church that lived in a cultural reality and within that reality, there were some potentially very divisive situations that were threatening the visible expression of their unity, that were threatening this high call of God that we looked at last week to live in biblical community. And so would you turn to the 14th chapter of Romans? 14th chapter of Romans. As you turn there, let me give you the context of what was happening in the church at Rome there in the very first century. The church there, if I would put that in the members of that church into two categories, it would be this. There were Jews that had become Christians that were a part of that church, and there were Gentiles that had become Christians that were a part of that church. And the proximity of those two categories of people made for some highly, potentially highly divisive, hot topics that would bring stress and tension on living within community. Let me just explain that a minute. You need to understand the context. It'll help us understand the text. The Christian Jews of the first century that were in the church at Rome, the Jews that had be accepted Christ, had gotten saved, had come out of the practice of the Jewish religion and into the Christian faith. They, that was a recent move, first century, that's a recent move. And they were Jews that were very proud of their heritage, heritage that had spanned generation after generation. A heritage that included God giving them his laws and his commandments through Moses that had become the very structure for their lives generation after generation. And two significant aspects of that were related to diet and special days. Diet and special days. There were things in 
the law and ordinances that God had given to Moses that dictated what a Jew was to eat, the acceptable foods, the clean foods, foods that would be pleasing for God for the Jew to eat. And there were special days that they were to observe, like the Sabbath day or special holidays or festivals throughout the calendar year. And those were divergent. They were potentially very contentious with the Gentile Christians who were not steeped in a history related to those. And you say, well, that's not a very big deal. Oh, you don't understand how big of a deal it was for them. We can't understand that. But it was significant, divergent convictions. And so what Paul does here in the 14th chapter of Romans is that he uses those potentially highly divisive issues, hot topics that were impacting relational connection, that were impacting the fleshing out of biblical community in the life of the Roman church, and he uses those to teach them principles about how to live in biblical community in the midst of that tension. And so what I want us to do is not have a history lesson here. I want us to find in the truth, in the word of God that we're going to look in today, principles here that are timeless principles that we can take out of this chapter and take out of the setting of the first century church at Rome, bring it to the 21st century church in Anchorage called Cornerstone, and we can apply it to these divisive, these potentially hot topics that threaten our visible relationships and unity with one another, like vaccine or no vaccine, or masks or no masks. It's a very good connection, principles that apply to both equally. And so let's see what God through the pen of Paul would want to teach us today. Romans chapter 14, let's begin in verses 1 to 4. Paul writes, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who Who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So let me just state a key truth here. We're going to have to go fairly quickly through a big section of uh, Romans 14 this morning. Uh, Years ago when I preached through this, I probably had 10 messages in the the section of Scripture that we're going to try to cover here today. I'm going to try to put some key principles together here for you, but here's a key truth here. Those who are strong in the faith are to accept those who are weak in the faith without quarreling over opinions. That's a key truth in this passage of Scripture. Let's talk about weak in the faith, strong in the faith for a moment. Can't go into much detail here, but just so you can get get an idea of the context. Those who are strong in the faith, Paul refers to, and those who are weak in the faith. So who are those who are weak in the faith? The weak in the faith are those believers who do not understand the liberty that they have in Christ and they are still 
under a conviction that there are things that they really need to be doing to live in a right relationship with God in their actions that are related to some of the instructions that came through Moses, like diet and the observance of days. And so they try to ardently follow those things in order to live in a pleasing way to God. And those strong in the faith understand their liberty and they know that they can eat all foods in a way that is thankful and honorable to the Lord. And so there's this potential tension. Those who are strong in the faith, as it says in verse 3, those who eat, they shouldn't despise the one who abstains. Like, look down on them and say, oh, you're just not there yet. You don't understand what you should understand. And those who are weak in the faith, who are really concerned and are trying to live by a list, what are they not to do? Not to pass judgment on those who understand their liberty. They're not to say, oh, you are living in immorality when you do that. And they're condemning them for it. So here's these two groups of people. Two ideas that are really deeply seated in the history and the mind of the Jew, even the Christian Jew. And so there's significant potential tension, just like there's significant potential tension over the topics that I mentioned this morning related to our culture and so many others. But here's the truth about diet and the observance of special days or non-observance of special days. Those are amoral, amoral. They're not inherently right or wrong. They're not definitively sin or not sin. It's related to the condition of the individual and the conscience they have that makes them right or wrong for an individual. It's not blanket sin for everyone if they don't observe special days. And one of the struggles that we have is at times we take non-essential things and we slide them closer to or try to tuck them under the realm of essential things. And we make more of them than we should and allow them to become points of division because we feel so strongly and passionately about them when the reality is that they are non-essential. That does not mean not important. That means they're not salvation contingent issues. They're not definitively stated in Scripture as what is right and wrong. And so don't make the mistake here in this passage, though, of taking Romans 14 and saying, oh, here's what Paul's trying to do. He's trying to answer the question, is it right or isn't it right to eat foods, certain foods? Or is it right or isn't it right for the believer under the new covenant to observe days or not? That's not Paul's goal. He actually answers the question here, but that's not why he's writing about it. And if you make that the point of Romans 14, you miss the big truth. The point that Paul is wanting to drive at here is this. The critical issue is what is your attitude related to one another as you live in relationship as believers? How do you Flesh out your relationship with one another in the midst of these issues, even if they are hot topic, passionate issues that you are worked up about 
They're non-essential issues. How do you relate to one another? How do you relate to somebody that is on the radical far end of the spectrum than where you are? Radically divergent from your convictions. How do you relate to them? How do you, how do you feel toward them? What's your heart toward them? Do you see them as lesser than you? That's true of diet. That's true of special days. That's true of vaccination or not. That's true of masks or not. I just want you to make that connection here. How do you relate to one another in view of those issues as a believer? I'm talking about other brothers and sisters in the Lord. Do those issues cause you to separate in fellowship, to judge, to look down on? Paul is trying to teach us something. Let's look at the goal that Paul had in writing here. This section really is begins in Romans 14, 1, and goes down to the middle of chapter 15, all about the weak and the strong and how they are to live in relationship within the body. So let me show you what Paul's overall goal is in writing this section. I want you to go down to the 15th chapter, and we're just going to look at three verses here quickly, just so I can identify Paul's explicitly stated goal, Romans 15, 5 to 7. Romans 15, 5 to 7. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you, here it comes, to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So I would say it like this. We could say it with a short phrase. Here's the goal. God's glory through relational harmony. God's glory through relational harmony. He says, I'm writing so that you would live in harmony with one another. Why? So that with one voice you can glorify God together. God's glory through relational harmony. That's the goal that Paul has in view that he explicitly stated for this section of Scripture. And so what he wants in the church at Rome is even in the midst of these two potentially divisive issues is he wants God's glory to come out through relational harmony. And what God wants for cornerstone believers and all the tensions that we are walking through in our culture and the variety of opinions and the strength of them related to the vaccination or not or masks or not and a whole gamut of things that go along with that is God's glory coming through relational harmony. That's what God wants. And so here's a question, an important question. What is going to help us as believers to live in relational harmony for the glory of God? Is there an answer in the text here from Paul to the church at Rome that we can say, oh, there's the principles. We need to take them from the Word of God and apply them to the 21st century here at Cornerstone? And the answer is absolutely yes, there is. There's actually more, I think more than three, but let me just show you three. These are three principles that will help us live in relational harmony for the glory of God, even in the face of very divergent convictions on issues that we are absolutely passionate about. Number one is this, verse, look at verse three. 
Let not, this is chapter 14, Romans. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. Here it comes. For God has welcomed him. For God has welcomed him. Here is a principle that will help you live in relational unity even in the midst of highly divergent convictions and it is this, God has accepted them just as he accepted you. God has welcomed them just as he has welcomed you. What that phrase means that God welcomed them, it means this, God fully accepted them into his family based upon the person and work of Jesus. Just let that sink in for a minute. Based upon the person and work of Jesus means this. He gave you, by His grace, Christ's perfect righteousness. Amen. Not a cleaned up, bondoed human righteousness. No, it is Christ's perfect righteousness. You have a full standing before God at salvation because you are given the very righteousness of God. And that's true of the one that radically disagrees with you over some strong opinions that you have about non-essential, I don't mean not important, but non-essential for salvation issues. God, if they're a saved believer, God has fully accepted and welcomed them just as he has fully accepted and he's welcomed you. Who then am I if God has lavished his grace on me, unmerited, undeserving grace upon me in abundant measure that I would then look down my nose at someone else that God has said fully accepted, fully welcomed, fully grafted in and adopted in to the family. Just be careful that when we come into contact with issues like this that we're passionate about and have divergent convictions with other believers about that we don't kind of put them in a probationary category of acceptance before God. God did not make diet and observance of days a contingent reality for accepting us fully before him at the throne. It is only the person of Jesus and our conviction about him that grants that to us so that we shouldn't put other believers in a kind of a secondary class situation if they have to us shocking convictions that we just think they should not have about these kind of issues. So we need to, in order to live out relational unity, we need to apply this principle here, understand that God has accepted them fully. We need to have the attitude of Jesus here. Just process that for a second. We need that attitude of Jesus. Here's the point. The way to determine our attitude and what it should be toward those other believers with the virgin opinions is to ask this question. What is God's attitude related to them? And his attitude related to them is if they are saved in Christ, he has fully accepted them. Full standing, full adoption, children of the king, join heirs with Jesus, and on and on. Here's a second principle that should help us live in relational harmony with one another. Verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Here's the principle. 
God is the judge of them. They are not your servant, they're God's servant. It's the master that judges the servant, not the servant that judges the servant. Both of us are servants before God, and the one that has the right to assess and evaluate life is God himself, only God, not us. So we should not be looking at others and passing judgment on them about issues that are non-essential issues. They already have a master who's more than capable of doing that. He doesn't need our help to do that. He's really good at doing that. We are not God's investigators of others' lives. Thank you. The person got that. We are not to play God in the lives of others. I'm not trying to downplay the strong convictions that you may have related to these two issues or a plethora of others. But be careful not to define something as essential that is not essential and to make it a point of division. If they're a servant and you're a servant, you both have the same standing before God and that standing is the righteousness of Jesus and full acceptance. Here's the third principle that will help us to live in relational unity in the midst of radically divergent convictions. The second part of verse 4, let's read 4 again. It is before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. He will be upheld. That's an incredible statement right there. What is it that enables a believer to stand? It is the grace of God and only the grace of God. We don't merit it in any degree whatsoever. It is a sovereign work of God. He will be upheld because that's the work of the Lord. And not only our standing before God, but you know the only reason we can serve God and be of use to Him? It's because of His grace that we can do that. Not because we deserve it, it's because of His grace. It's grace upon grace that enables us to do that. And so God, it says here, will make the service of another believer useful. God will enable them to stand. We don't enable other believers to stand by our assessment or evaluation of them, and they don't enable us. It's God that does that, and God says He will do it. And so when you look at others and connect with others that have radically divergent opinions than you do about things that you are highly passionate about that are non-essential issues, you need to understand that God is sovereign over their life and He's promised He's going to do something. And so you need to look at them in that reality and they're probably doing the same thing to you. Oh God, they need so much help. Would you please help them? But those three principles are clearly, however you want to say them, but they're stated here as ways that we can learn to live in this relational harmony that Paul says he's writing about that will result in glory to God. We need to understand that God has accepted them fully and that he's the judge of them, not us. He's the Lord of them, not us. And he doesn't need our help being the Lord over them and that he is absolutely going to carry through what he began. He's going to make them stand. So live in relational harmony. 
Secondly, have biblically informed convictions. Have biblically informed convictions. Look at verse 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Listen to the last part of that verse again. Each one, each believer, should be fully convinced in his own mind. And what's the subject matter that's being talked about? Non-essentials. You see that? One person esteems one day as better than another. And that person, that believer, needs to be fully convinced in their own mind about that. See, each believer, every believer, should have full conviction in their mind. This is an important statement here that we need to understand. What does it mean to be fully convinced? To be fully convinced means that you have a conviction about a certain issue, whatever it is, maybe about vaccination or no vaccination, You have a conviction about that action, whether you should or whether you shouldn't. And your conviction should be that you determine your course of action based upon what you believe is the most pleasing thing that God would have you do. And you have a conviction about that so that you then walk out that conviction in the decision that you make. And so we as believers are called to have these kind of convictions. And where are we to get the convictions formed from? From the truth of God's word. Biblically informed convictions. You can't form God-pleasing convictions in your own insight because God's ways are higher than your ways, as high as the heavens are above the earth. What you need is a mind renewed continually by the Word of God. So we are called prolifically in Scripture to use the Word of God, that the Spirit of God wants to use the Word of God in the sons and daughters of God to help them think rightly so that they have the right biblical worldview, convictions that help them to live in ways that are honorable to God. So have biblically formed convictions. Be fully convinced of the things that you believe in, the opinions that you have about these critical issues in your mind. Now just notice here, this is not a suggestion. I just want you to see the imperative nature of it. It's not a suggestion. It is not simply a right. Paul is not saying this is a right that a believer possesses Uh, to make their own decisions about these non-essential issues. That's not what he's saying. He's giving a command here. Each one must be fully convinced in their own mind. He's telling us under the inspiration of God to do something, and that is come to a full conviction about these things. So we're to let the truth of God form and shape our minds so that we arrive at the convictions that God would have us arrive at so that we can live in the way that we believe is most pleasing to God. So, live in relational harmony. Have biblically formed convictions. Number three, honor the Lord. Live in a way honoring to the Lord. Look at verse six. The one who observes one day declares observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So here, kind of main principle, kind of key essence of the Christian life here. This is a 
just a supreme truth that should kind of rise up in every believer like an artesian well in them that saturates kind of an engulfs and carries them along so that it shapes their desires and their motives and their action and it's simply this the lordship of jesus christ it's what's being talked about here the lordship of jesus christ we are to do what we do in honor of the Lord. We are to understand that Jesus is our Lord. And so what we do, the convictions we have and how we carry them out, we are to do them in such a way that it, in our conviction, our conscience honors the Lord. The best course of action to honor the Lord. That's what he's telling us to do here. So, lordship, living under the lordship of Jesus means it impacts how we live our lives and how we order our days and use our strength and choose our paths and craft our words and regulate our relationships. All of those are to be done in a way that honors the Lord and, and from an endless list of other issues. Whether or not we honor the Lord is more significant than whether or not we eat the right diet or observe or don't observe days. Please see that. The issue here that Paul is pointing to is what is preeminent. He's putting things in an order here. And because honoring Christ is infinitely more significant on whether we esteem one day as more valuable than another, listen, a person that esteems a certain day as Holy can please the Lord in doing so. Just like a person that says there is no one day more holy than the next can do so as a way to honor the Lord. Did you hear that right there? Two people, two believers can do the absolutely opposite thing and both of them can be doing what they do in a way honorable to the Lord. It's the truth of the text. Listen to it again. Verse 6. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of of the Lord since he gives thanks to God while the one who abstains abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God you see that there's a person eating and he's honoring the Lord giving thanks to God and there's one that's abstaining and he's honoring the Lord giving thanks to God completely different conviction and conclusion and action. And yet Paul's saying that both of them can do that as an honor to the Lord because it's based upon the conscience that they have. What they believe is the right thing to do. And what you need to be is guided by God's truth and secondly, guided by your conscience. You can do something that may not be inherently wrong and if your conscience believes it's wrong, it's sin for you. Two people can do the absolute opposite thing and both of them believe the other is sinning in what they do and God can say, both of you are pleasing me. Both of you are honoring me. Because the issue is the condition of the heart. You see, the why is always more important than the what. Related to non-essential issues, the why is always more important. The heart is the issue. And so here in Romans in the first century, Paul is saying there can be believers strong in the faith that understand their liberty and they are 
enjoying the creation of God and the food that God has provided. They're not limited in what the di their diet and they eat what they eat in thanks to God as a way to honor him. And in the very same body of believers, there can be another believer that he's calling weak in the faith that doesn't understand their liberty and still believes they have to live by a set of rules. But in the doing of that, they're doing it to honor the Lord. They are striving to live in such a way that is honorable to the Lord. And both of them can be pleasing the Lord because their heart is in a right posture toward him. So how do we deal then with differences of opinion on things that are significantly important and that we're highly passionate about that are non-essential issues? Well, we do our best to understand the truth of God so that the way that we look at the world is formed by the truth in the word of God so that we have a biblically oriented world view so that our minds is shaped by the truth of God's word and then we do what we believe we are being shown to do related to these decisions in life. We try to live them out in a way that most pleases the Lord. And as we do that, we realize that our brother or sister in the Lord may come to a very different conviction than we have come to, and they can be pleasing to the Lord in the decision that they have reached, and we shouldn't sit in judgment on them, look down upon them in a demeaning way, or to look across at them and say, you're living immoral. We should trust God to be God in their life and make sure that we are living to the best of our ability with biblically informed convictions, making sure that we live in relational harmony as we try to honor the Lord. That relational harmony and the attitude that we have to one another is far more important than the opinion that we have on secondary issues. What Paul is doing here, I want you to just see this, close in just a couple of minutes here. What Paul is doing here is he's moving from the insignificant to the preeminent. Now I'm using that word, I don't want you to take that word too far. I'm not saying that the things that you are highly passionate about, like if vaccination is one or non-vaccination is one or masks are one or non-masks are one, I'm not saying that those are insignificant things. What I am saying in this is this, compared to the truth of the lordship of Jesus and the unity of believers, they're insignificant. I mean, preeminent and insignificant. Paul is moving from the things that are lesser in this text to the things that are greater. He's calling us to the greater things and make sure we don't jettison the greater things because our focus is on the lesser things. Romans 7, 14, 7 and 8. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So he's moved now into preeminent reality here. This is issues about the Lordship. We, our life is to be the Lord's. That's what's critically important. I just think about we were singing a song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Even vaccination or not. Even masks or not. If we're focusing on those, they become big. But when we turn our eyes upon Jesus, they grow dimmer. 
I'm not saying they're not important and that you shouldn't have conviction. You should have full conviction, but you shouldn't supplant the greater for the lesser. And so what Paul does here as he moves from the insignificant to the preeminent, he's teaching us something here. And here's what he's teaching us, that we are to live by doctrine. We're to live by truth. We're not to live by opinion and preference and assessment. What we're to do is find the truth of the word of God and anchor our mind there and our desires there and our understandings there. Truth like this. If they're saved, God has fully accepted them. That's truth that we need to anchor our convictions in. Truth that Jesus is the Lord over our life. That's preeminent truth. That's doctrinal truth that needs to shape the way that we assess secondary preferences of life. So doctrine, truth, Theology is to inform us. So we've seen three things. Relational harmony. Biblically informed convictions. And living in honor to the Lord. And then here's the last one. Live in love. Verse, I'm just going to have you jump down to verse 13 of chapter 14. And then we'll close. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Make a decision that you don't ever want to be a hindrance to another brother or another sister who is trying to follow Jesus. He's telling us about orienting in our minds, what is most important. And so let me say it like this. He's telling us here not to live for our enjoyment, but to live for the benefit of others. He's telling us don't live to enjoy the liberty that you have in Christ, though you have it. Here's what you should do. Live to express Christ's love to others. That's what you should do. So in other words... If you understand some liberties that you have and you are around a brother that doesn't understand them or a sister that doesn't understand them and you exercising those liberties could be a stumbling block to them, then here's what you should do. I'm going to give up my liberty because I care more about them than I do about getting what I want. I am prioritizing in love what is going to most benefit them. That's the way Jesus lived. That's what took Jesus to the cross. He did what he did so that he could bless us. He took the hardest path so that he could bless us. And so here's the last statement. When love conflicts with liberty, choose love every time. When love conflicts with liberty, choose love every time. So, live in relational unity. Have a biblically informed set of convictions that you live by. Live to honor the Lord and live out a life of love. And as we do that, that will help us to live in the biblical community that we are called to live in so that discipleship can happen, so that we can spur one another on to love and good deeds as we live in harmony for the glory of God. Please stand. Father, I just pray now. I ask you to take these words and apply them to hearts and minds. I don't know how they need to be applied. Only you do. But you really do. And so I pray that you'd speak to us, speak to me where I need to apply these principles where I'm not and how to 
walk in them and do that for all of your sons and daughters in here that would help us to live in harmony for the glory of God as a church. Pray that you would keep us from turning our eyes too much upon the things of the world that become too large in our view, but instead to turn our eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his beautiful face so that those things here on earth become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In his name I pray, amen.